Okay. All right. So um, what we're hold on. All the lights here. Okay. So um, I just handed back the second exam, uh, and again, I think as a whole, the class did fantastic. Um, again, tickle there. The grades are already reported uh, on uh, on Blackboard. Um, I still need to update attendance for Monday, um, but uh, in terms of homework, everything up through homework seven is graded. Um, so homework seven and homework 8.1 uh, are still outstanding, uh, but I, I think we're pretty much rocking and rolling at this point. Remember, you have your project due the Friday um, before Thanksgiving break, okay? Uh, oh, there you go. Okay. Um, any questions? And, and, and I guess I should also ask, how did the last homework go? Was that pretty straightforward? Hopefully good. Okay. So today what I want to do is I want to tie up some loose ends regarding influence lines, and I want to focus on two, two different sets of problems. Um, I'm going to lightly cover trusses, and you'll see what I mean, but I want to talk about fixed supports um, today because fixed supports can cause maybe a tad bit of confusion and I want to see if we can um, address that. The other thing is if we're doing well on time I might actually jump into the next lecture. Um, there is a chance I might be a few minutes late to class on Friday because we have a green and white day. Um, I'm going to try and book it back here as soon as I can but I wanted to mention that while it was on my mind. Okay, um, so we're still utilizing the mueller Breslau principle and again I kind of like to read it verbatim so we all know what we're talking about here. So. Um, the principle states that the deflected shape of a structure represents to some extent um, the uh, uh, influence line for, for the force effect uh, uh, if the quantity in question is moved through a small displacement. So we identify a response of interest, we take that response and we move it through a unit displacement by removing from the structure the ability to resist that response. And whatever the structure looks like after it's deformed, that's the influence line. <laughs> so because we're dealing with statically determinate structures, or what, let me say it like this, when you are dealing with a statically determinate structure, if you remove from the structure the ability to resist a response, you create an unstable structure. So what that means is that the structure can't deform, it can't bend, it's just going to rigidly move. That's why all of the influence lines for determinate structures are straight line segments, okay? Um, now, I want to... Um, take a second and talk about fixed supports. Now, I want everybody to, to look up here because this is kind of important. So I want to be clear that none of the rules that we have derived so far are, are violated whenever we're dealing with a, a, a fixed support condition. But I think they do require a little bit further investigation because I've been doing this for a long time and this is an area where you can <coughs> easily make a mistake. Okay, so I want to Let's look here. Okay, so I want to look at what maybe the influence line might look like for a vertical reaction at a fixed support. So let's think about the Mueller Breslau principle. Okay, the Mueller Breslau principle says we remove from the structure the ability to resist that vertical reaction. And we move that through a unit displacement. Okay, but the thing is, I said we're removing from the structure the ability to resist the vertical translation. Or vertical reaction. I didn't say anything about that moment reaction. Okay, so when you apply your deformation, you do you translate the joint, but you do not rotate the joint. So if you're drawing your influence line at a fixed support and you do this, that's wrong. Okay, this if you're deflecting it, what you would be doing is look. If you look at this point, this point has not only translated, but it has rotated. That's wrong, okay? Because there is still a moment reaction there keeping the joint from rotating. Instead, what do you do? You do that. You totally lift the whole thing up, okay? Because this, this translation would be just that, a translation with zero rotation, okay? So whenever you're dealing with a fixed support, you lift the whole thing up. So, like, I'll come up with an example here in a second that's, like, a little wild. Um, but when I show you the wild example, the simple example might actually make a little bit more sense. Okay? Um, and so the other thing I'd say is that for moment reactions, it's the same thing reversed. Like, if you have a moment reaction, if you're trying to draw the influence line for the moment reaction, you would rotate the joint, but you wouldn't translate it. Okay? So I want to draw some influence lines for this problem. Okay, this is about as basic as it could get. 
Um, but I kind of want to show you um, a more, bless you, I want to show you a more complicated one. And then if you understand the more complicated one, maybe the simple one will make more sense. Okay? Um, you'll see what I mean. That is land surveying. Let's move to it. this. Okay. <clears throat> if it will load. Come on. Is it not liking me right now? Well, while this is loading, let, let, we'll let it do its thing. Let me come up with an example that's a little involved here. Okay? So, if I have to close this and open it, I will. Okay, and, I, and I'm going to get kind of nuts with it. Let's say, all right, let's do this. Let's do, and let's do it like this. Let's do it like this. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. And let's also add some hinges. Let's do a hinge right here, a hinge right here, and a hinge right here. This is a really involved structure, right? Okay. And I want to draw the influence line for the vertical reaction at A. Okay. So what I would do is I would remove from the structure the ability to resist that vertical reaction, but nothing else. So again, a lot of the same principles would hold true. So, right? So what we would do is, okay, let, if we're drawing the influence line for the vertical reaction right here, what's the value right here? Zero. This has got to be zero. What about right here? Zero. zero and... Zero. Okay. So what we would do is we would take point A and we would move it through a unit translation but not a rotation. So right here, the value would be one, okay? But it would not rotate. It would just be flat, okay? So I'm going to close this and open it. And if I have to do this on the board, I will do it on the board. Let's try that again. Okay, finally, it woke up. Okay. All right, maybe I'll copy this into the notebook after this, uh, after this, this thing on the board. Okay, so we lift right here. Now, what happens when we get to a hinge? Remember, a hinge serves to, like, change the direction of the influence line. Well, it's the same thing here. So what's the hinge going to do? It's going to cause that rigid segment to go like that. Then we're going to get to this hinge, go through here, get to this hinge, go back there. Okay. Now I haven't put any values on here, but again, like the idea is that you're sort of seesawing on those roller supports and you lift this point up a magnitude of one, but you don't rotate it. This would be a much more complicated one. All right. But does that idea kind of make sense? How, how you would construct an influence line for a structure like this? So if you understand that, let's do influence lines for this structure, okay? This is a lot more basic, okay? But if you understand what, what I've got here on the board, I think you can do this one very easily, okay? So, ah. All right, I'm just curious, based on this right here, can somebody tell me what they think the influence line for AY is going to look like? What does the influence line for this vertical reaction look like? What do you think? Say it again. It's just a solid straight line. And sir, that is 100% correct. The, what does the influence line for AY look like? You just go up, boom. And that's the influence line for AY, right there. That's it, okay? And if you would like sort of a, I don't know, a theoretical underpinning on that,
Like, why is that? Let's consider the following. Let's consider a beam that's cantilevered. And let's put a single vertical load on it. And it doesn't matter where it is. I propose that there is a vertical reaction right here, AY, and there is a moment reaction, MA. What is AY? One. It's one. But the question I want to ask is, does it really matter where the load is? Like if the load was here, or if the load was here, or if the load was here, or here, or here, or here, or here. It doesn't matter, right? Wherever the load is, the vertical reaction is one, which is why the influence line is a constant value of one across the entire span. So not only does, it make, does this influence line make sense from this kinematic muller breslau perspective, but it also makes sense from a statics perspective. Make sense? Okay. All right. So, so if I sum forces in the y direction, a y equals one. Now, what about let's let's look at this section right here. Let's see if we can discern from this, from our statics perspective, what we think the influence line for the moment reaction at A is going to look like. So if I place this load at some arbitrary distance x from the support, and I say, okay, I want to sum moments at the cut. Well, sum moments at the cut, let's, uh, let's scooch this up a little bit. Oh, not at the cut, no. I'm summing moments at the support. Sorry. I'm trying to solve for a reaction. Okay, so if I sum moments at this, um, at this support right here, what do I have? Do I have to consider a y? So I have 1 times x, and then I have m a, right? So I did a very bad job of writing that as a subscript. That's supposed to be m sub a. So that is supposed to be m a, and that's going to be 1.0 times x, or... MA equals X. So what does the graph of Y equals X look like? Just bing, right? That's all it looks like. So I propose that the influence line for the moment reaction at A that the influence line for this looks like that. What is the value going to be at this very high peak? It's going to be 20. And how did I get 20? I go over 20 and up 20. MA equals X. Okay. Because what is the slope of this line? If the rise over run is 20 over 20, the slope of that line is one. Okay. So what did I do? Now that, that's the statics perspective. What about the kinematic muller breslau perspective? What did I do? I took this point and I moved it through a unit rotation. A rotation such that the slope is one. Okay. Now, um, the only other thing that I would mention is that whenever you are drawing influence lines for moment reactions, it is conventional to indicate your sign convention. We don't really do that with vertical influence lines because we always assume that upward reactions are positive. But when you're doing moment influence lines, sometimes you kind of need to indicate that. So what I'm going to do is put that there and say that this is a counterclockwise positive. So that when I look up a value, so for example, what is the moment reaction when the load is in the middle of the beam? It's 10, right? And it's 10 counterclockwise. It's pretty easy to see for a vertical reaction. If you get a positive answer, it's up. If you get a negative answer, it's down. But for moment reactions, it's conventional to actually indicate your sign convention. So I'm going to do that here. And on the homework assignment, I have you do that uh, as well. Okay. Does anybody have any questions? 
So far, so good? Okay. Now, this is where I want you to put your thinking cap on. We're going to draw the influence line for the shear at B. Okay, and the influence line for the shear at B, so what we're doing is here's the beam. So this is A, and this is B, and this is C. Okay, and so this distance here is 10 feet. 10 feet. Okay. Now, um, let me get ready for this. Okay. So, let's recall, Mueller-Breslau principle says that I need to install a shear release and move it through a displacement, right? All right, so let's put this shear release right here. Okay. Now, before I draw this influence line, let's use some common sense before we actually start drawing anything. Let's write down some rules. Before, we would have an influence line and it would look, you know, something like that. That would be our shear influence line. What is this distance? One. Okay? So I'm going to say one. Total jump is one. Okay. All right. Ignoring the influence line, the, the Mueller Breslau principle, I mean, ignoring that principle. What's this? What is the value of the influence line that the supports for internal shear? Say it again. Zero. Zero. Because if you place a load directly at a support, the beam doesn't see anything, right? The load goes all to the support. So the value of the influence line at the supports has to equal zero. Okay? But here's another thing I want to I look at. Now let's look at this, this influence line. What could you tell me about these slopes? No, not, no, you're thinking about the moment influence line. I'm talking about the shear influence line. The same slope. Okay. So, equal slopes on either side of shear release. Four. Positive sign convention. Okay. Now, are these the, is there, I mean, this is all true, right? So this is our positive sign convention. Okay. All right. Now, the fifth point that I want to raise 
And then I'm going to ask you to take these five thoughts and put them in your head and see if you can tell me what the influence line, what it looks like. Spell. Influence lines for determined structures are linear. Okay. So let's put all this into our head. The total jump has to be 1. The value of the influence line, if it supports, is 0. We have to have equal slopes on either side of the shear release. That's our sign convention, and the influence lines have to be straight. Now, I want somebody to put those five thoughts in their head. Somebody guess, what do they think the influence line looks like? Say it again. Okay. So, you're saying this goes down. No, it starts one up, and then it goes down. So, this rotates. This is a fixed support. This doesn't rotate. Does it continue with a slope of zero for the shear release and then shoot up one and then go on? That's the answer. The influence line for the react for the shear at B is that. That is the influence line for the shear at B. Right there. Okay. Okay. Now some of you are like, what? Why does the influence line look like this? Okay. I propose to you that from a kinematic perspective, this makes sense. But if you're not convinced, let's look at the statics perspective. Okay. Okay. So I want to draw this beam, and I want to draw this beam. Same beam, OK? Now, for the same beam, where is our point of interest? Where is point B? Right smack dab in the middle, right? So our point of interest is right here. And I want to consider two scenarios. One scenario where the load is over here and one scenario where the load is over here. Okay? Now, let's consider this scenario over here on the left. So imagine that this cantilever beam is this marker, okay? And, well here, I'll use, a, I'll use the, my water bottle. Okay. So imagine this cantilever beam is this water bottle and I have a load on the water bottle right here, okay? How much is this part of the beam seeing when the load's right here? Nothing, right? It's just going along for the ride, right? I propose statics tells me that any time the load is from here to here, the internal response in the beam right here is zero. That's what the influence line's telling me from a kinematic perspective, but we're getting it from a statics perspective as well. Because if I cut a section and I look to the right, all I see is this and I see that, right? Some force is in the y direction, there's nothing there. It's zero, right? What about over here? Okay, I cut a section, look to the right, Put that load there, positive internal response. If this is one, what's that? One, right? So as soon as the load moves to this side of the section, I get a sudden increase in shear equal to the load. So I go from zero to one. Does that make sense? That, ladies and gentlemen, is why the influence line for the shear at B for a cantilever beam looks like that, okay? Make sense?
All right. So if that's the case, let's just see if you all can help me out with this. Let's draw the influence line for the moment at B. Let's see what that looks like, okay? So again, same story. Now we are going to install a hinge right there, and we're going to put that through a unit rotation. Now, what we were doing for simply supported beams is we were doing something like this, okay? And I propose that's not going to be the same thing here, okay? Like before, Let's see if we can reason our way through this. Let's see if we can use some logic and figure this out. Now with shear, we were interested in a total jump. What are we interested in for moment? It's not a total translation, what is it? The, and, okay, say it, all right, all right. So what you're saying is that the slope on either side of the, the hinge has to be one when you sum them up. So the so rule one, total slope change is one, okay? Let's see if we can match what we did up here, okay? What is the value of the influence line at the supports? It's zero, right? If I put a load directly on the support, it doesn't generate any internal response in the beam. Okay. What about the third roll? Uh, um, third one. Equal slopes on either side of the shear release. I'm not really sure we had that um, uh, that rule with moment influence sign, so I think we could probably skip that. Let's put our sign convention. That one's still true. So, so I want you all to put those four thoughts in your head. Remember, we are doing absolutely nothing with that support on the end. Right? So. Okay, we're doing absolutely nothing with this support over here. Absolutely nothing. So here's my sign convention. Here's my total slope change value of the influence on the supports. I want somebody to put these. Somebody other than Mr. Dangerfield. He's doing a lot of work there. Somebody other than him. Somebody put these thoughts in your head and tell me what does the influence line for the moment at B look like? Zero from A to B and then um, diagonal line from B to C. Diagonal line going up or down? So we're looking to the right of this, so we're, yeah. we're going down because this way it's going down. So it's exactly right. The influence line looks like, what color I use red? We'll use red again. So we went here, here, 
That is the influence line for the moment at B. Is there, are there any characteristics of this diagonal line that you can tell me? The slope is 1. So if the slope is 1, what's that? Negative 10. Well, yeah, I, yeah, it's negative one. I'm saying the magnitude. Right. That that's a that's a very fair point. Yeah, so we'll say negative one. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions on this? I have one other influence line problem I want to show you, but you don't need to do any hand counts for it. Before I do, does anybody have any questions? Okay. So there's one problem we have yet to do, um, and that is the consideration of influence lines for trusses. Um, and what I mean by that is if I have a truss, draw an influence line for the internal force in a given member, okay? Um, now, I want to be clear that the mueller breslau principle theoretically would apply, okay? But what you would have to do for a truss is you would have to remove from the structure the ability to resist, like, a force in a member, and then take that member and either, like, stretch it or contract it, and then see what the truss looks like. I don't know about you, but I, I can't visualize that in my head. If you can, go for it, but... I just I can't really like do that in my head and most most engineers uh, would have a very difficult time doing that and so really the only effective way of drawing an influence line for a truss is to just brute force and what do I mean by brute force I mean move the load analyze the truss move the load analyze the truss move the load analyze the truss and I know that would sound like a pain to do by hand which is one of the reasons why we would have software do a lot of this work for us like mass hand we could build a truss model, and then just move the joint and just record the forces. And let me, let me kind of give you kind of an idea of one, oh, sorry, I forgot about this. There is one other idea that you have to consider, uh, and that is, do you apply the load? So when you move the load across the structure, do you put the load on the bottom joints, or do you put the load on the top joints? And what I say is, apply the load where the road is, okay? So, for example, on a truss like this, I would apply the loads along the bottom joints, whereas a truss like this, this deck truss, I would apply the loads on the top. Okay, it just depends on whatever type of structure you're dealing with. Okay, does that make sense? So, let me kind of show you how this works. Okay, so here's a basic truss, and let's say we wanted to draw the influence lines for a few members, and I, I picked a few members out. There's no magic behind these ones. Um, uh, in order to analyze this and in order to do it, and don't worry, I've got this solution in the slides, so you don't have to, to do this one uh, by yourself. But um, what we would have to do is put a unit load here, and then method of joints or method of sections, the whole thing. And then put a unit load here, do the whole thing. Unit load here, do the whole thing. And so ultimately, we probably need to solve the truss three times. But I say maybe two if we can be a little smart about it and exploit some symmetry, okay? Um, it's a bit repetitive, but it shouldn't be too difficult, okay? So if I was doing this problem, the first thing I would do is I would do this, okay? I would draw the influence line for the reactions, okay? And that's fine. There's nothing that says you can't use the mueller breslau principle for that. For example, for EY, I kick that roller out, I lift the truss up, and so that's my influence line. So this is my influence line for the reaction at E. This is my influence line for the reaction at A. And since the joints are evenly spaced, then... Like, if they're all spaced at 20 feet, then I know this is 3 quarters, 2 quarters, 1 quarter, 0, or 1 quarter, 2 quarter, 3 quarter, 0. That that's, should be pretty easy to follow, right? So then what I would do is I would do this. I know there's a lot going on here on this slide, but what I would do is I would put the load here and analyze the truss. And then put the load here and analyze the truss. So there's a, a lot going on here, okay? But I want to say a couple things. So, so number one, let's just consider this first analysis up here. So if I put the load there, in order to analyze a truss, the first thing that you need to do is compute the support reactions, right? No, because with influence lines, we already know that if you put the load here, that's 0.75 and that's 0.25. And where did I get that? I got it from here. So we don't need to actually compute those reactions. We can just have the influence line do it for us. Now, the truss analysis, yeah, we kind of need to do it. Um, and unfortunately, this one, we kind of need to work our way through all of it. Okay, so this is the load at B. 
And so what I would then do is I would take the load, I would move it to C and do the whole thing, do it all over again. Now I want to say a couple things about these. So this is the load at C. And if you look at this structure, it's completely symmetric. So it's symmetric with respect to load, geometry, boundary conditions, whole nine yards. So with this one, I could probably start here, analyze halfway over, and then just mirror the results over. So I don't need to do the whole thing. And then with this one, okay, this is the load at B. If I were to take the entirety of the results and just mirror them, that would be the results for the load at D, right? So if I was smart about it, I don't need to do it again, right? I could just mirror those results, okay? And then in order to construct the influence lines, all I need to do is start picking members and say, okay, let's take member A, B. When the load was at A, what was the result? When the load was at B, what was the result? When the load was at C, what was the result? So on and so forth. Um, what we do when we do this is we take tension as positive. So anytime there's a tensile force, it's positive. Anytime there's a negative force, it's compressive. Um, and then it's always zero at the support. So if you place a load directly at the support, the truss doesn't see anything. So when you plot it, these are some plots that you would get for some influence lines for truss elements. So a couple things I'll point out. Um, so these two members up here without recalling what the truss looked like. Can anybody guess where these members are on the truss? These members would be on the bottom, right? Let's go back to mechanics of deformable bodies. When you take an element and you deform it, right, like this, like smiley face bending, the top's in compression, the bottom's in tension, right? So these truss members are on the bottom and the influence line values are all positive, right? So that's why they're all positive. And what's the difference between A, B, and C, D? They're just on opposite sides of the truss, so it's, boom, it's just mirrored, right? Okay, if this is on the bottom of the truss, where is member F, G? It's on the top, right? Because that doesn't matter where you put the load, member F, G is always gonna be in compression. That's a member that's on the top. Where do you think member C, F is? So, member C, F, is this member, okay? It's an interstitial, it's a diagonal, okay? And what happens with diagonals, usually in most regular trusses, is that when the load goes from one end to the other, like from one end of the, the member to the other, so this is where joint uh, B is, joint C is, when it switches over, um, the member switches from tension or compression, okay? That, that tends to happen with diagonals and trusses. Think of the diagonals as kind of like the web and a beam, and so the web and a beam is kind of like the shear diagram. So when you jump over that other end, the shear kind of switches a bit. What do you think this member is? What do you think this, this what do you think member BF is? The, one vertical. the vertical member. And what's happening with the vertical members is that when the load is directly under it, it's one and it's zero everywhere else. So actually, the only member that is truly a zero force member throughout the entirety of the truss is this one in the middle, right? It will always be a zero force member. So the only purpose that that member is serving is as a brace for this compression member up top. It will always be a zero force member uh, for the entire structure. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Anybody have any questions? Okay. Um, we got a little bit of time, and I kind of want to delve into the next lecture a little bit because I want to, I, I, I think you're going to find some really cool stuff with this. Okay, so let, let's talk about, let's talk about um, this next lecture a bit. So this next lecture is about applying influence lines. And what I mean by that is, is we've got this nice pretty picture of an influence line. What do we do with it? Like, what do we do with it? Okay. I propose there are two direct applications for an influence line. And the first application is to directly perform structural analysis. Okay. Um, what I'm getting at is if I know the response due to a unit load, what about determining the response due to any load? How can I take an influence line for this and analyze a structure for this, okay? For loads and distributed loads anywhere. And the answer is we can do that. The way that we do that 
is we take, the long and short of it is, we take the influence line value times any point loads, and we take the influence line area under any distributed loads and multiply those. And when you sum those up, you get your response, okay? And the best way of showing you that is to actually see if we can work through a really basic example. Let me show you something. Bless you. All right. I have here this problem. Okay. I want to see if I can determine the influence, uh, or I'm sorry, I want to see if I can determine the vertical reaction at D for these loads. Okay. I want to see if I can determine the vertical reaction at D. All right. Now, ignoring everything about influence lines, I've got to believe that this is a problem that you all know how to do, right? So if I were to ask you to do this problem, how would you do it before influence lines? How would you do this? Well, um, you'd say, okay, if I want to find the reaction at D, how do you find the reaction at D? Maybe you sum moments at A. Is that right? So what do we have? Like let's just let's just do some stuff here. So I can collapse this into a single point load of 26 kips, right? Y'all with me on that? So what do we have? We have 26 kips times 10 feet. What do we have? We have 25 kips times 40 feet. What do we have? We have 42 kips times 60 feet. And don't worry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do some of this math for you, okay? And what is that going to be resisted by? That's going to be resisted by some reaction here, dy times 80 feet. Is everybody with me on that? So what do we got? We got 26 times 10, that's 260. 20 times, 25 times 40, that's 1,000. 42 times 60, that's 2520. So this is going to be, what, 3780 foot kips equals dy times 80. So therefore, dy is 47.25 kips going up. Like, was that too fast, or are you with me on that? Is that okay? So watch this. Let's use some influence lines. What would the influence line for the reaction at D look like? Just going up like that, right? So the influence line for the reaction at D would go like that, right? So zero. All right, if I did this, so notice how the beam is split up into 20 feet. So see how I did quarters, right? Um, would you agree with me that the area of this part is one half 0 0.25 times 20, which is 2.5. Would you agree with me on that? So far so good? Because that, that's where the distributed load is. So watch this. I propose dy is gonna be 1.3 times 2.5 plus 25 times a half plus 42 times 0 0.75. And if you chug it out, you'll get the same answer. So what did I do? Distributed load times the area, load times value, load times value. Set it up.
Check me if I'm wrong. But that will be the exact same answer. I don't know about you, but I, like when I first saw it, that blew my mind. But you can just do that. So you can find the reaction for this beam due to any load anywhere by just drawing the influence line and taking loads times the value, distributed loads times the areas, and just summing it up. Done. You can make a lot of really cool observations about uh, structures. But what we're going to do next time is we're going to take this and we're going to answer a more difficult problem with moving loads. Um, let me, uh, before we end, let us start class at, um, let's start class five minutes late. Let's start at 11.05 next time, okay? Because I'm going to be coming to green what day? 11.05? 11.05.